Good afternoon. Welcome to the 2 p.m. April 20th, 2021 joint session of the City Council and Parks and Recreation Commission. I have a few announcements and then we will move on to our meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. All council members and commissioners are participating in this meeting remotely. I want to thank the public for staying home to view today's city council meeting. If you wish to comment on today's agenda item, call in now and when the item is introduced using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note, there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to speak on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it is time for public comment, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak during public comment, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. You may hung, hang up once you have commented on your item of interest. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll for both the City Council and the City's Parks and Recreation Commission. Thank you, Mayor. Council Members Watkins? Here. Calentari Johnson? Here. Council Member Brown is currently absent. Um, Cummings will be absent. Golder will be late, currently absent. I'll circle back around to Council Member Brown. Here. Here. <laughs> Hi, Sandy. Mayor Bruner. Present. Mayor Myers. Present. And Commissioner Greensight. Yes. Yeah. Lavis is absent. Mio? Here. Pollock? Present. Scott Norris? Present. Vice Chair Locatelli? Um, I'm present, but I don't think I'm the Vice Chair. <laughs> okay. Chair Brown? They're muted. My apologies, sorry. I'm here, I'm not the chair anymore. I'm the vice chair, um, Jane Mio is the chair. Thank you. That's it, Mayor. Did you get Jane too? I did, I got her. Yeah. Great. Okay. Our agenda item this afternoon is report on Parks and Recreation Department budget and financial outlook. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you are wanting to comment on this, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff followed by questions from council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. So our item for this afternoon is the report on Parks and Recreation Department budget and financial outlook. Before we get started, I know we are all waiting and I see that this announcement's gonna come out right now. Um, so I'm just gonna, if you don't mind telling me, I'm just gonna give us two minutes to hear this verdict because I think we're all somewhat distracted by this timing right now. I understand you have a verdict. Members of the jury, I will now read the verdicts as they will appear in the permanent records of the 4th Judicial District. State of Minnesota, County of Hennepin, District Court, 4th Judicial District, State of Minnesota Plaintiff versus Derek Michael Chauvin, defendant. Verdict, count one. Court file number 27, CR 201264.
We, the jury, in the above entitled manner as to count one, unintentional second degree murder while committing a felony, find the defendant guilty. This verdict agreed to this 20th day of April, 2021 at 1.44 p.m. Signed, juror four person, juror number 19. Same caption, verdict count two. We, the jury, in the above entitled matter as to count two, third degree murder, perpetrating an eminently dangerous act, find the defendant guilty. This verdict agreed to this 20th day of April, 2021 at 1.45 p.m. Signed by jury four person, juror number 19. Same caption, verdict count three. We, the jury, in the above entitled matter as to count three, second degree manslaughter, culpable negligence, creating an unreasonable risk, find the defendant guilty. This verdict agreed to this 20th day of April, 2021 at 1.45 p.m. 34 person, 019. Members of the jury, I'm now going to ask you individually if these are your true and correct verdicts. Please respond yes or no. Juror number two are... Huh. Okay, Tony, I think we can start with the meeting. I'm gonna turn this over now to um, Tony Elliott, our Director of Parks and Recreation, and Lindsay Bass, Principal Management Analyst of our Parks and Recreation Department. Tony and Lindsay, welcome. All right, good afternoon, Mayor and City Council members, um, and Chair Mio and uh, Parks and Rec Commission Judge members Mayor. as well. Oh, can you hear me? Oh, sorry. Number 85, are these your true uh, Hang on, I gotta turn this off. I'm realizing you guys are on my computer. Sorry about that. Juror number 91, are these Okay. Juror number 91, are these your true and correct verdicts? Sorry, Tony, go ahead. All right, no, thank you, Mayor. Wow, that's hard to, hard to follow that. That's, um, yeah, a big, a big moment here. Um, all right, well, I uh, very much appreciate this opportunity today with the council uh, and commission. Uh, this is my first opportunity to have a, a joint study session like this and just want to thank you all and appreciate your time. Uh, City Council, I know you're on a, a bit of a marathon this month uh, with study sessions and regular council meetings pretty much every Tuesday this month. Uh, and for commission members, uh, this is an off month for us, so appreciate your time and getting together uh, as well. So thank you all uh, very much. So I'm going to share my screen here. Hang on one second. All right, can you all see the presentation there? Mm -hmm. All right. So yeah, what we'll do today, um, uh, Lindsay Bass, Lindsay's our principal management analyst, and I will uh, go through a presentation really to provide uh, quite a lot of detail, um, uh, but at a relatively high level here today. Uh, Travis Beck, our park superintendent, uh, is with us, and then Rachel Kaufman, our recreation superintendent, uh, is with us here uh, today as well. So. The purpose of this meeting today, I know we have a relatively uh, short time here in two hours, but the purpose of the meeting today is to provide the City Council uh, and the Parks and Recreation Commission with uh, broad contextual information uh, really on the state of Parks and Recreation. Uh, a few weeks ago, we delivered an annual report uh, to the City Council. Um, and in that annual report, we touched on some of the key challenges that we're facing, but the meeting today is an opportunity for us to go into much more detail. And so I know we had discussion with the council about, uh, you know, where are the bar graphs and where's the, where's the data? And so today is an opportunity uh, to get into more detail and really look at uh, our financial picture, our operational picture, uh, and where we, where we stand. Um, over the next uh, really several weeks um, with both the commission and the council, um, the department and the city as a whole will be going into its fiscal year 2022 budget discussions. Um, for Parks and Rec specifically, we will present our budget at the May 3rd uh, Parks and Recreation Commission meeting. Um, and then we will present, um, we'll present uh, information to the city council along with all city departments uh, later in the month of May. And just to start as we go into this, um, I think we all know, uh, in fact, I wish we could all be in a park today or out at the beach or something that would seem much more appropriate than on a Zoom call here, but I think we know that, the, that Santa Cruz largely is defined by its 
uh, parks and its opportunities for recreation. Uh, we we live for the weekend. We live for the parks. We live for live for our recreation programs uh, here in the community. And so again, we're just very grateful to have this opportunity to talk with you all, uh, get your feedback, get your recommendations in terms of making this the best park system and parks recreation department that we can for the city, knowing how important these services and these spaces are uh, to the community. So we wanna work together to make sure that this system remains healthy uh, and vibrant and sustainable uh, well into the future. So I talked just briefly uh, about the timeline in terms of our fiscal year 22 budget. We won't go into great detail on our fiscal year 22 budget uh, today because the city as a whole um, is still kind of working through that uh, and prepping uh, to present to the various commissions uh, and the city council uh, coming up in the, in the next few weeks here. But what we will do today is we'll provide a department overview. We're gonna talk about some of the key trends and challenges uh, that we are facing in the department. Uh, we will provide a bit of an overview of our fiscal year 22 budget. Uh, Lindsay will share our fiscal sustainability roadmap, which is a series of uh, efforts that we're undertaking within the department uh, to make sure we're fiscally sustainable into the future. And then we want to uh, share some of our policy priorities and recommendations with the commission and council um, and start to have a dialogue about uh, what some of those might look like uh, into the future. So. Um, we don't have a specific recommendation um, for the council and commission today, but really wanna use this time to take your questions, seek your feedback, uh, and provide information and detail that we can all use, the commission, the council, the community, uh, the department, that we can all use towards successfully implementing our mission uh, for the department uh, into the future. I promise I won't talk the whole meeting. I'll go through a few slides here relatively quickly and then I'll send it over to Lindsay to, to keep on with our presentation. Um, so our department overview, and uh, forgive me, uh, this is I think largely for, uh, for the public just to kind of set the, the framework of uh, what we do within Parks and Recreation, the scope and the scale of our operations. So our mission is to provide environments, experiences and programs that enrich the lives of residents and build a healthy community. In addition to our mission, our national trade agency, the National Recreation and Parks Association, has three pillars that define the purpose and core mission for parks and recreation agencies. And those three pillars are health and wellness, social equity, and conservation. And those are almost identical to our city's health and all policies pillars of public health, equity, and sustainability. So we've got a really clear vision and really consistent uh, with the city's health and all policies uh, framework. So in terms of our core services, we've got some images and kind of a snapshot up here, but uh, overall, Parks and Recreation maintains over 1,700 acres of parks, beaches, and open spaces, uh, urban forestry. Uh, we maintain restrooms, ball fields, the pool, golf course, uh, the municipal wharf, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, we uh, maintain over uh, 169,000 square feet of facility space. Uh, we do both minor and major capital improvement projects that create unique places uh, to foster relationships with people and nature and offer uh, really a civic presence. Uh, we provide opportunities for city residents and visitors to play and learn and socialize uh, via in-person and online programming for youth, teens, adults, and seniors. Uh, we deliver strategic support in the form of community partnerships, uh, management, system planning, environmental compliance, and large project uh, management. Um, and finally, we do, uh, deliver administrative support in the form of public information, uh, events and activity permitting, advisory body, uh, work and collaboration, sister cities, for example, uh, public education, services uh, and assistance, um, and so on and so forth. So we do a lot within the city parks and rec uh, department. In terms of benchmarks, I'll spend the next few slides here talking about how we measure up. And I think this is relevant for the council uh, to know and be aware of, and I think the commission to know and be aware of. So this is, this will get relatively nuanced um, over the next couple of slides, but I'll try to keep it really straightforward. So, you know, big picture, big picture of the park system, the Parks and Recreation Department and the system that we have in Santa Cruz, 
really is a, is a world-class park system. Um, compared to national standards, we are above virtually all national standards. Um, this graphic might be a little bit hard to read on your screen, but is a, um, in your report is kind of a snapshot of some of those comparisons. But even in comparison to other California uh, agencies, parks and rec agencies, Santa Cruz really stands above, um, above the rest. But in terms of some of those national comparisons, the park system that we have here has tripled the national average of hiking and biking trails, 34 miles versus 11 miles, which is the average. 96% of all of our residents live within a 10 minute walk of a park. So we're among the best in the United States in terms of access to parks with 96% within a 10 minute walk. Uh, the number of residents per park acre is twice, twice as good as the national standard. So we have approximately 1,100 residents per acre. National average is about tw almost 2,300 residents per acre. So we have a lot of parks, a lot of park space for the community. And then in terms of cost recovery, we're really close to the national average. We're a little bit above the national average at about 27%. And that is a ratio of the revenues we bring in annually versus our annual expenditures. So 27% uh, overall cost recovery. So I wanna dive into this in a little bit of detail. One of the attachments in your packet has comparisons with other uh, with other agencies throughout the state. And so these are a few of our comparison agencies uh, that management partners compared the city with uh, when it did its work on our financial uh, forecasting uh, a few months ago. So, um, so I have four slides similar to this, I'll kind of go through, go through these one by one. So uh, in looking at these comparison cities, so we're looking at Davis, we're looking at Santa Barbara, and we're looking at Ventura. And um, so to compare these, uh, among these comparison agencies, Santa Cruz Parks and Rec, our operating budget per capita is actually higher uh, than these other comparison agencies. So we spend uh, Santa Cruz Parks and Rec about $250 per capita on an annual basis. Uh, Ventura is the next closest at about 214 per capita and Davis spends about 202. Uh, in terms of full-time employees per capita or per 10,000 residents, uh, we have the most here in Santa Cruz. So among the four cities, we have the most full-time employees at 13 per 10,000 residents versus the other cities, which are seven, five, and five, uh, respectively. So I want to tee this up because this will get, it's become an, um, an interesting and I think relevant comparison here. So we talk about being under-resourced, but when you look at these numbers, I think it begs the question, how can we be under-resourced if in comparison to these other agencies, we've got you know 13 uh, full-time employees per 10,000? So I'll kind of adjust our comparison here as we go through. So as I mentioned, Santa Cruz offers uh, 26 and a half acres of parkland per 1,000 residents. Uh, the national average, again, is about 10 acres per thousand. So we're two and a half times uh, the national uh, average. And even among our comparison cities, Davis, Santa Barbara, Ventura, uh, we are above the rest um, in terms of acreage, um, uh, acreage per thousand, acreage per capita. Um, I think it's worth mentioning here that um, you know within the city limits, these numbers don't include uh, state parks or state you know state resources either. So we've got those resources within our city limits and, and nearby um, as well. So we have uh, a lot of acreage uh, per capita um, within the city. And then in terms of our annual operating expenditures per acre, so this isn't uh, operating expenditures per capita that we looked at a minute ago, but this is operating expenditures per acre. So with a large park system, um, our investment per acre uh, is far below the, the comparison uh, agencies here. So we are under $10,000 per acre um, in terms of the investment. Uh, that we make. And this is just looking at land. So this is not including the 169,000 square feet of facilities. This isn't looking at the, at the wharf. It's not looking at the Civic Auditorium and so on and so forth. So 
these last four slides, I think what what um, I think the key takeaway here is that to me these really reflect that we have a world class park system. I mean, we have a large park system for a city our size, and the diversity of amenities that we have is is off the charts, really. Um, it, it's a pretty diverse and pretty amazing, uh, you know, array of park properties um, and amenities. And so although our investment per capita is high, our investment per acre and by, uh, by these assets is, is very low. So this is a key challenge as we move forward um, in thinking about how we invest into our system. Do we invest differently in neighborhood parks or community parks versus open spaces? Or do we invest more in facilities versus land? Um, so these are the type of, I think, policy questions uh, that we'll have into the future. So that's just a little bit of the, some of those benchmarks. One of the one of the unique things I think about Santa Cruz in particular, um, in comparison to Davis, Ventura, and Santa Barbara, is we we are a, a, obviously a very heavy uh, tourist uh, destination. Um, and so I'll just give you a, a quick snapshot to go relatively quickly through here. But generally speaking, the National Recreation and Parks Association. Uh, issued a white paper and basically um, reached a, what seems like a very logical conclusion, and that's that people travel to destinations for the amenities. Um, and it's a lot more complicated than that, but that's basically, you know, you don't travel to ride on a plane, you travel to go visit, uh, a, you know, the beach or whatever it might be. And in Santa Cruz County, uh, tourism uh, just tipped over the $1 billion uh, annual revenue mark uh, before the pandemic. So the tourism is a $1.1 billion industry in Santa Cruz County uh, based on the 2019 figures. Uh, the uh, average travel expenditures per person are $604 per trip or about $151 per day. Um, and the most popular beaches in Santa Cruz County, the top two are Main Beach and Cowell Beach. Um, most popular surf spots, the Lane, Cowell Beach. So people are coming to Santa Cruz, to the city, to use our amenities and our parks within the city. So um, I put this in here because I think we're a little bit unique and the demands on the parks here are unique. And I've talked to Visit Santa Cruz County about this specifically and compared to some of these other uh, agencies. So Santa Barbara in particular, um, from a tourism standpoint, is they brand themselves as the, uh, as, the, as the Riviera, I think the American Riviera. So the experience in Santa Barbara is largely geared toward uh, cuisine and shopping and so forth. And people go for the beach as well. But I think in comparison, we're closer to Ventura, where it's more of a, a beach community, but even beyond just the beach. There's so much here uh, beyond uh, just the beach. So heavy tourism economy and parks and recreation uh, is right um, at the forefront of being involved in that. So. Um, I've got one more slide, then I'll send it over to, to Lindsay here. So, oops. All right, so this is a very dramatic looking slide, but wanted to talk through uh, kind of where, where we are. So this next uh, portion of the presentation, we wanna talk about some of the key challenges uh, facing the department. So uh, I talked about staff a little bit uh, earlier and staffing per capita um, is high, staffing per acre is low. But as it relates to staffing for the department, really across all functional areas within the department, we have really skeleton crews across the department. The Wharf Beach crew is, is a skeleton crew. The crew that we have at the London Nelson Community Center is really a skeleton crew. Um, the Parks Division, uh, also a skeleton crew. The golf course, you could say the same. So really we have about the minimal amount of staff in virtually every functional area in the department um, uh, just to, to, keep things, uh, to keep things going. Um, this was sort of um, demonstrated, it's been demonstrated through the pandemic. So uh, as part of the pandemic, we have the hiring freeze, we have uh, 83 full-time staff uh, on board currently, but only 75 of those spots are filled. So we have eight, uh, eight frozen positions. Um, and as a result of that, the effect has been the closure of facilities uh, uh, and closure of parks. So Lower De La Viega, Laurel Park has been closed. 
all of our public restrooms have been closed uh, and so forth. So that's how, that's how narrow the margin is or how lean we are. I think with eight staff across the department uh, being vacant, it, it has literally led to, to park closures. Um, just wanted to mention uh, that, that sort of lean nature of our, of our staffing overall. Uh, big picture, and we'll talk about this a little bit more from a capital improvement standpoint. Uh, this was mentioned in the, in the agenda report. Uh, the department has approximately uh, approximately $100 million in deferred maintenance of facilities and parks. And we've seen facility failures over just the past couple of years, the golf course lodge uh, and restaurant, uh, the Market Street Senior Center, uh, Nueva Vista Community Center, uh, as water infiltration into that building, uh, the golf cart barn and driving range has uh, collapsed or a portion of it had collapsed earlier in the year. Uh, the Civic Auditorium's roof uh, is leaking uh, and, you know, constant issues out at the wharf as well. And so we have these emergent uh, needs and critical uh, needs across the infrastructure. And this is not unique to Parks and Rec. I think this is the case largely across the city. But uh, within Parks and Rec, the investment that we've made in these assets over the past uh, 10 years has ranged from about $200,000 per year, $200,000 to $500,000 per year in terms of capital improvement. And really a department and a park system this size, um, we should be investing in the range of 4 million to 6 million per year. And we're investing 200 to 500,000. Um, as a comparison, a community outside of the state, Boulder, Colorado, uh, spends I think between five and seven million dollars per year in capital investment uh, into their system, which is uh, similar uh, to our scope and scale here. Um, and then another uh, kind of looking at, the, at our image here of the of the uh, nearly uh, broken rope here. Um, our external factors are another major uh, element that's affecting our, um, our ability to execute and implement uh, our mission. And so um, this is something that we've worked with the commission and the council on, and this is a very, I think, uh, kind of timely and, and relevant uh, discussion, but especially as it relates to the issue of homelessness um, across the community. This has been a major external factor in terms of people living in our parks, impact on the environment, um, uh, litter and debris, uh, fuel tanks, so on and so forth. And so this is a, uh, a major element that has taken us away from executing our mission. And so um, in particular, as I talked about earlier, the NRPA's three pillars and the health and all policies three pillars, uh, especially those of sustainability and conservation, those have been dramatically impacted by impacts of, of people living uh, throughout the park system. And so while we have expertise in land management and horticulture uh, and so forth, um, those uh, staff experts um, are really geared more toward, almost exclusively toward cleaning up abandoned camps and trash and so forth, rather than investing um, into habitat and resource management and so forth. So, um, and looking at the department's mission uh, in a similar fashion to project management, I'll talk about this more at the end of the presentation, but we have to balance our uh, resources that we have, our budget resources, our timeline, and the scope of our operations. And in this case, our resources are increasingly going toward an increased scope of work, especially as it relates to the effects of, of homelessness and external factors. Um, and therefore, resources are diminishing for other core needs and our timeline to implement projects and services, uh, capital improvement projects in particular, is being impacted. Those are being delayed and, um, and becoming a bit more expensive over time. So that's kind of a summary of some of the challenges, and we'll dive into this in a little bit more detail uh, over the next couple slides. So I will kick it over to uh, Lindsay. Great. Thanks, Tony. Um, so just to go into a little more detail about some of the attachments that were included in your packet, um, we wanted to provide a bit of a historical look back um, at some key areas of the department, staffing being one, taking 
a historical look at our cost recovery and then also at um, in, uh, the types of revenues that we're pulling in um, to be able to dedicate towards things like capital improvement given some of the challenges that Tony just mentioned. And so the slide in front of you, um, and again, uh, this is a back casting, but it is not a, it's not a perfect analysis. You'll see that there are some gaps in the years. Um, so we were trying to take snapshots that would give us a picture of, you know, what, what has that staffing um, level looked like um, over this 10-year time horizon. You'll see that um, in FY09 and 10, we're still seeing a pretty um, steep drop from um, impacts from the Great Recession. And um, those are predominantly um, positions that uh, left the department. Those weren't positions that transitioned elsewhere um, necessarily. We saw that prior to um, FY09 um, with positions that went to um, public works for facilities, things of that nature. But these are positions that you know we have um, lost here in the department, maybe minus one or two. Um, the one blip in the screen is additions and then the subsequent transition of um, the ranger positions to PD. And so um, uh, if you even just kind of <laughs> uh, take that out, you'll see that from FY10 to FY21, the department has basically been kind of holding steady um, between this 80 to 85 FTE range. And so um, from before the Great Recession, we definitely have not rebounded. Um, and then in addition to that, we know that there have been a lot of changes in how we are um, managing and staffing around um, park enforcement um, through relationships with PD um, and the CSOs that sit there now. Um, next slide, Tony. So um, as we look at that, um, in order to look to the future, we wanted to understand our history. And uh, thinking about the level of capacity in the organization where we sit today um, to accomplish the things that Tony has outlined um, around our mission, um, but also to be able to um, be able to grow back, we need an element of additional staff to be able to take on um, new programs, um, help us implement um, a backlog of capital improvement projects. And so as we look to the future, we look toward um, a destination where we're back at 100 FTE as um, kind of a, a milestone for us to get back to um, that will make us um, a, a healthier um, department from that staffing capacity um, standpoint. Next slide. So uh, this next um, few slides will cover the topic of operational cost recovery. And this is something that the department has been spending a lot of time um, investigating, um, understanding the dynamics around our operational cost recovery. So these are just um, uh, operational expenses and revenues. It doesn't include any of our capital activity. Um, and this is a lot of information in this slide. I'm going to break it down really quickly. Um, um, but just to say, um, expenses are towards the bottom, personnel is in orange, um, non-personnel is in gray, and then our revenues are in blue, um, kind of above the line um, in the positive. And the percentage that's there is showing you our, our cost recovery. So of what we spent, how much were we able to recover through our own department, revenues, rents, fees, um, things of that nature. Um, what we're not able to cover um, through those revenues is covered as a subsidy from the general fund, essentially. So um, that larger pot of property taxes, sales taxes, et cetera. Um, and that is a fund that you know all of the other um, general fund departments also draw on. And then the fund that we see a lot of um, uh, uh, stress around um, resulting from COVID. Um, but if you look, you'll see that um, 
the, from an actual uh, cost recovery standpoint, our uh, cost recovery has ranged from um, around uh, 33 to um, uh, 45, 47%. Uh, um, but in the most recent years, it's been dropping down a little bit. Um, however, if you look at revenues, they've stayed pretty consistent and steady. Um, where we see the changes are in the orange and the gray below the line. And so there's a lot of interesting dynamics that are happening in our cost recovery related to um, expenses. And so we know that our personnel costs are going up. But in addition to personnel costs, there are other pressures that drive up our expenditures. Those are things like utility increases. So as the water department um, struggles to address its own infrastructure issues and looks at rate increases, those rate, rate increases affect our department. Um, similarly with electricity, natural gas, um, further things like minimum wage increases and just increases around um, staffing for um, contractor-based projects, those costs are also going up. And so what we have here is over time, um, those expenses are creeping up and our revenues have stayed uh, more flat. And that's where the department really wants to focus a lot of energy um, in the coming few years is to kind of change that dynamic and begin to allow um, our revenues to keep better pace with our expenditures so that we can maintain um, a cost recovery that's in a range that is um, uh, sufficient for the general fund and, and what you would expect of um, a parks and recreation department. Now I'll say, even over that time horizon, the department has continued to outperform the national average in terms of park, um, cost recovery for parks and recreation agencies. Um, so we're doing a big up job, but we also know that some of our comparable agencies um, have higher cost recoveries as well. So um, we, we want to investigate that more and do a lot more work in that um, area, and I'll go into more detail on that um, as we move through the presentation. Next slide. So we're talking about revenues. We wanted to give you guys a sense of when we talk about department revenues, what do we mean? What makes up that blue box <laughs> that you just saw in each of those columns on uh, the previous slide? Um, and these are according to their contribution to um, our total revenue. But our two biggest sources of revenue are the rents that are collected from businesses out on the wharf. So the more active and vibrant our wharf area is, um, the better uh, our revenues perform, and that helps our department cost recovery. Similarly, the golf course, which has been a point of conversation over the last year and a half um, as an issue with the council and commission um, for its cost recovery, um, is and has been one of our biggest sources of revenue. Now, we all know that it has a big expenditure budget, but um, this year, the golf course, with the implementation of a new operations plan, um, is returning revenues that have actually put it into the black. So um, this is a phenomenal achievement. It's something that I think as a department, you know, we're really fired up about, um, not only to continue that good work, but to um, apply that same kind of thinking to these other areas of the pyramid, right? To see, we want to grow this pyramid. <laughs> um, so just the other categories that are here um, are youth-based programs. Um, are huge, um, bring in a lot of revenue, and that's an area that will continue to be a major strategic focus um, for the department. Civic box office and concessions, they've been hit so hard by the pandemic. Um, it was looking like that recovery um, for large type events was gonna be a lot slower, but with the governor's latest announcement, you know, there may be opportunities there for the civics, so that's another area um, for us to focus on. Classes, sports, and park rentals round out the pyramid, um, and so those are all areas that, you know, we would love to see um, uh, get uh, far greater, um, and we'll do a lot of this work um, through leveraging some uh, 
efforts and analysis that have been underway that were also in your packet. So in your packet, we talked um, or included a snapshot on the recreation and leisure study. And so a lot of the findings com coming out of that are going to help us do some business planning around some of our recreation programming all with um, uh, an eye towards cost recovery. Um, furthermore, we included the revenue policy in your packet, and this is something that um, we're looking at to help guide how we look at our fee structures and how we um, change those fees over time in a way that maintains affordability and access, but also allows us to um, capture cost recovery where it's appropriate. Um, or I should say higher cost recovery where it's appropriate. Next slide. So as we have uh, gone down uh, the rabbit hole of cost recovery and really tried to immerse ourselves in these dynamics, um, it's one of the things that we uh, understand is that we don't operate in a silo. So um, the decisions that the department makes absolutely affect our cost recovery. The department center decisions, as an example, um, are things like our fee structures and increases. It's how we utilize and optimize our facilities and our staff. So it's not always a solution of increasing fees. It can be, well, geez, if we operate the facility differently, um, we can actually drop our expenses or we can pull in more revenue without touching our fees. Um, so those are uh, things that we need to make decisions around um, and are focused on. Further, in accordance with our revenue policy, there are very appropriate things that we need to subsidize. You know, we provide an invisible social safety net um, to some of the most vulnerable populations in our community. We want to be able to continue to support community partners that are doing good work um, with those populations by offering free and reduced services and contracts for those partners. Um, as we do this work and as we make these internal decisions that affect our cost recovery, though, we also want to keep a uh, line of sight to uh, decisions and pressures uh, and challenges outside our department that can affect our cost recovery. And so um, on the right side, you'll see some examples of that. So in terms of budget direction, this can be things like um, labor negotiations and um, contract negotiations that are negotiated, negotiated at that HR or citywide level. You know, those aren't things that our department um, has a hand in, but we're affected by them, and those affect our cost recovery. Um, similarly, some of these big issues around um, homelessness and how we support the unhoused population um, and manage um, the, the impacts that that has to our uh, spaces and places um, also affects cost recovery. And in a similar fashion, um, while the department provides subsidies um, for uh, city partners uh, in the community, uh, so does um, other uh, parts of um, our city system. So whether that's city council or other departments, um, understanding how we're helping to support um, our awesome community partners um, is key to uh, making sure that we're um, well utilizing um, our resources. Next slide. So now I'm going to turn and talk a little bit about um, our capital improvement. This is an area that Tony flagged as a big challenge. Um, this is a slide from our capital improvement presentation uh, from last year, and um, it is holding true uh, this year just in terms of the message that you see. Um, so from a department standpoint, we work really hard to complete, tee up um, new projects, um, and continue to drive a portfolio that's chipping away at the most critical needs in our capital improvement portfolio. However, year to year, we tend to carry with us a pretty significant unfunded package of projects. And so um, 
this is a big area, and Tony mentioned um, right here, we actually articulated last year in our capital improvement um, submittal $12 million in unfunded projects, but Tony indicated that, you know, when we think more expansively um, to some of these um, assets and projects that are um, less uh, clearly outlined or specific in their, um, uh, in their budgets, we estimate that the need is closer to $100 million. Um, so that adds a whole another dimension, potentially, to this chart. Um, so this is something that we really want to get our hands around and really begin to build out um, a strategic plan for how we can begin to more uh, completely address some of these urgent needs. Next slide. So I want to talk a little bit about um, what we are able to bring in to address the pro the this um, larger problem of the 100 million in unmet needs. So um, oftentimes, um, most departments are reliant on the general fund, and over the past several years, the city's general fund and CIP has been deferred, so it's been unfunded. Um, as a parks and recreation department, we have a couple of other revenue sources that we can look to. Um, there's two main sources. The first and the larger bucket is our park tax fund. And this fund was established to account for special taxes collected on construction of new or remodeled residential buildings. Um, the second bucket was established pursuant to the Quimby Act, which authorized the city council to require developers of new subdivisions, so this is around subdividing lots, to dedicate land or park development or pay in lieu fees um, of park dedication. And so um, those fees can only be expended in the areas where those subdivisions are um, being made. And so there are um, restrictions on where that can be spent. And so as you all know, um, the nature of development and how um, permits move through the planning process um, is a little difficult to, um, uh, to estimate. And so um, absent a crystal ball, <laughs> <laughs> we do our best to judge which projects are going to come to fruition and how those fees are going to come into um, or come to a place where we can actually um, utilize and program them um, for improvement projects. Um, so in your packet, we talked to, or showed a little more information about um, how we budgeted um, for park tax and Quimby quadrants um, over the last 10 years. And in total, over that 10-year period, we had budgeted to bring in about $8.2 million. Um, in effect, what ended up coming in was closer to $5.6 million. Um, so clearly, you know, there's more work for us to do to get a better line on how we um, budget those particular fees to see if we can get that to be a little more accurate. But I think the larger question is, you know, even if we had pulled in $8.2 million over the last 10 years, um, it still wouldn't address the size and the magnitude of our capital improvement needs. Um, so this is, I think, one of the conundrums that uh, we're, we're faced with um, and working to get our arms around. Next slide. And I think this next slide, I'm going to hand it back to Tony um, to uh, share uh, more insights on just some of the challenges that the latest um, uh, issues around the pandemic have brought to the department. All right. Thank you, Lindsay. And in the spirit of time, we want to make sure to give the commission and council uh, hopefully at least an hour of deliberation. Um, I know our meeting is relatively short today at two hours, so I'm going to fly through these. Uh, last slides here. So this cosmic looking slide is basically uh, to share the message uh, that uh, obviously the city had a structural deficit um, heading into the pandemic. The pandemic um, has made that even more challenging. On the, the good news uh, is the stimulus uh, that is headed toward the city, uh, which is kind of framing up uh, the budget conversations that we will have over the next few weeks here. So I wanted to just take a, a couple minutes here just to briefly talk about our fiscal year 22 
uh, budget. So what we uh, have our direction as of now, um, I think across the city for fiscal year 22 is, um, is to maintain a flat budget. Um, so you see here for parks and recreation, that's 16.3 million. Um, a couple of the critical needs that we have right now that we talked about earlier, we have eight vacant positions. Um, uh, several of those are within the parks division, which is, uh, impacts our ability to, to reopen. Uh, another critical need is related to reopening facilities. The Civic has been closed. London Nelson Community Center has been closed. So we want to reopen those, and the community is demanding that we uh, run junior guards and that we reopen facilities. There's a, this pent-up demand uh, that is there. So the direction generally is, is a flat budget. However, a couple of the discussions that we'll have in the coming weeks with both commission and the council uh, as we get into our budget discussions will be things like um, should we make some level of reductions going into fiscal year 22? Are there strategic reductions that we can make even with stimulus money coming in? Should we make some level of reductions uh, in light of the longer term structural needs? Uh, if we do make those reductions, what should those be? Where should those be? And how do we prioritize um, what that amount is and, and where we make those reductions? So um, those are the type of discussions that we'll get into in the coming weeks. Um, not quite ready to dive into that uh, today, um, but uh, as soon as May 3rd with the commission, we'll get into that in more detail. In thinking ahead of any potential reductions that we make or how we appropriate budget for fiscal year 22 and beyond, we have several priorities uh, here, and I won't read through all of these in the spirit of, of time, but I think one of the one of the core items here is that is that what we um, invest in in terms of our budget, uh, we want to uh, make sure that we can accomplish our mission one, but we want to make sure also that we're investing in sustainability. So we have on bullet point number two, this idea of build back better uh, that we borrowed uh, from the federal government. Um, and so what we invest in, we, we want to uh, uh, aim toward cost recovery, uh, toward investing in the, the core services for the community, but making sure that what we're investing in is sustainable in a structural way uh, moving forward. Briefly talked about timeline, again, May 3rd for our commission meeting uh, on budget, uh, and then starting meetings with the city council at the end of May on my birthday. Um, I wanna talk just briefly about strategic, a uh, couple of strategic gaps here, and then I'll send it back over to, to Lindsay. Um, but again, some of the, the core uh, gaps or challenges that we're facing, uh, staff and operational capacity, investment in our system, so the capital improvement, uh, standpoint and then sustainable revenue. So a lot of our revenues come through the general fund, various taxes that have uh, kind of been on a bit of a roller coaster through COVID, um, but also as uh, Lindsay mentioned uh, through Quimby uh, and park facilities tax uh, to, a, to a smaller degree. Um, I wanted to just take a quick second to just recognize that we hear a lot about needs. Um, we hear from the community a lot about we need to invest in and improve uh, our preservation of the San Lorenzo River. We need to uh, provide more services and opportunities for youth and teens. Uh, we need to raise funds to renovate the Harvey West Pool. Uh, we need to allocate resources toward improving our natural resource management, especially in our wildland urban interface areas. So there are a lot of needs that we hear from uh, the community, but that are also driven by our, by our master plans, uh, by our mission, by the city's general plan, by our parks master plan. So there are a lot of needs and demands. Um, and so the, the gaps that we face are how to, uh, how to get there. The one thing that I'll mention on these strategic gaps is this first item, staff and operational capacity. Uh, that is really uh, among the three is the priority because if, if, and we've talked about this internally, if we had more capital improvement funding to allocate toward projects, we don't necessarily have project management capacity within the department. So this has been a big question in the context of Prop 68. If we were to receive the $17 million in grant uh, awards that we've applied for, 
who would manage this and how would we handle it? So we would have a, an internal sort of reckoning to figure out how we're gonna shift duties around to figure out who could actually implement that $17 million. So in terms of priorities, that staff and operational capacity is critical to allow us to actually manage uh, projects uh, and so on. Uh, with that, I wanna send it back over to Lindsay um, to talk through our some of the things that we have been doing within the department as it relates to fiscal sustainability um, and kind of talk about the work that we're doing and then lead toward some of our um, our requests and uh, further discussion with the council and commission in terms of how we can partner and collaborate together to address some of these challenges. So Lindsay, I'll send it to you. Thanks, Tony, and I'll try to be brief just so that we can get to the public in your comments. Um, I think like underscoring this slide is the fact that we really want to take a multi-year approach um, and a future forward-looking approach to our fiscal sustainability. And so um, the, that was the impetus behind the development of um, this roadmap. Um, was to say, you know, here we are, um, let's start thinking about where we want to be and what we need to be doing now to set us up for what we want to achieve next fiscal year and in outgoing fiscal years to help stabilize and provide um, greater sustainability from a fiscal standpoint so the department can um, achieve its mission. Um, I won't focus on uh, the things that are happening in the short term, I'll look more towards the mid and the long term, um, but we grouped these into three categories of, you know, focusing on operations, so really thinking about like how we streamline that expenditure piece of our budget. Um, the next area was around improving that cost recovery, so um, thinking about um, new revenue opportunities, um, new uh, utilization models that we can uh, leverage, and then finally, um, how can we help support efforts to stabilize general fund resources? Um, so those were three main strategies that we um, have employed um, around our own fiscal sustainability efforts. And just in this midterm bucket around focusing operations, um, and Tony hit on this uh, repeatedly, was this need to return our parks and recreation service levels to normal. And that means staffing up. And so having to make the decisions around our FY22 budget to allow us to do that. Um, further, we are working really hard to realize administrative efficiencies, and so we've looked at the uh, pandemic a bit as an opportunity there, um, given the fact that people are having to work differently and having to be online, um, we've really been trying to move more of our forms, processes, um, and uh, access for programs um, to online um, and really streamlining how that happens for our external customers as well as um, our internal staff being able to leverage um, online services. Uh, further, uh, to Tony's benchmarking um, comments earlier, we really want to work to develop more targeted metrics. So the benchmarks have been really interesting for us to take a look at. Um, at that course high level, it's basically the only way that we can benchmark with our other agencies, just that's the level of data that we're able to get. But inside our own department, understanding you know what are the resource needs um, and how do those differ between things like community parks versus neighborhood parks versus open spaces. Um, and really beginning to dial in um, what performance metrics do we need for both our parks areas as well as our recreation areas. So our recreation team has done a great job working through um, their core program areas, devising goals and objectives, and now we really we want to build some uh, more detailed business plans um, around those efforts. Um, another recommendation that came out of the Recreation and Leisure Study was to take a look at our partner agreements and to revisit um, those to make sure that we're understanding and ensuring that those agreements um, and the subsidies that we're providing are appropriate. Um, do they need to be greater? Or do they need to be lower? Um, really evaluating that you know, with our principles and our mission in mind. Um, and, uh, and the last one I'll mention on focusing operations is just to support council efforts to address homelessness. So this continues to be a big draw on our operational resources and uh, we want to help support um, council efforts to um, find good solutions um, to those issues. 
Um, underneath improving cost recovery, um, I've touched on a lot of these. Uh, I'll mention, you know, we're going to continue to implement um, that golf course operations plan and hoping to see uh, the trends that have emerged this year continue into FY22. We want to see that type of approach um, cascade to other program areas, so into some of our kind of core priority recreational program areas like youth sports. Um, areas, but also explore pay-to-play options as well, so some of these new revenue opportunities. Um, and then finally, um, around stabilizing the general fund resources, we want to support um, ballot measure efforts. Um, I think that's a key uh, aim. You'll see in the long term we get a little more lean. Um, we're still working to develop and build out some of these things, so uh, input and feedback here um, is welcome and helpful. Um, I'll just mention uh, we're going to continue to uh, activate and manage with better performance metrics, um, start achieving some of these new cost recovery targets that we've set. Um, and then in addition to supporting the ballot measure efforts under the stabilized general fund resources, um, I think ultimately we'd really be interested in exploring is there a possibility for a potential bond measure for parks improvements. Um, next slide. And I also want to um, call attention to uh, these other key critical areas of support that we depend on. Um, and so to Tony's point, you know, we need the staffing capacity um, to drive programs around these key cogs um, to uh, ensuring our success. Um, however, you know, making sure that we are growing our donation base and our philanthropy to parks and recreation, knowing that our community loves its parks and recreation services, um, further helping them engage and um, be active in that space while we, you know, improve our capacity as a result is also key. And then, you know, finding those um, sweet spots of grants that um, are worth the overhead administration um, that's needed. Um, I think the Prop 68 uh, grants are, are good examples of that. Um, but also maybe lower hanging fruit that we haven't um, explored before we're beginning to take a look at. But again, it's our ability to get to those things and um, uh, really activate good planning around that depends on having the capacity um, in-house to do so. And with that, I'm gonna send it back to Tony to uh, bring us home. All right, thanks, Lindsay. Uh, so earlier in the presentation, I mentioned our kind of our approach in terms of executing our mission in the context of kind of a project uh, management format. So this image here um, are really the three prongs in terms of project management. So if our project is executing our mission, these are the three factors that we will reference. I think as we go into our budget conversations with the commission and council, uh, but I think we'll lean on this model a lot in terms of, you know, you look at this, the orange or reddish circle here, the scope. Our scope is defined by our park system and the facilities that we are, are charged with operating and maintaining. And really to accomplish our mission, our time, our schedule, our budget uh, need to be balanced with that scope. And so as we go into cuts potentially in fiscal year 22 or in future years as we uh, kind of reconcile uh, or deal with the um, structural deficit. Um, part of the conversation that we'll have with the commission and the council is making structural cuts in, uh, on paper or in terms of budget um, may, may not accomplish our goal as we think it might. In other words, if we're cutting uh, budget, structural budget, but we're not reducing our scope, then we're putting ourselves further behind. Um, in terms of deferred maintenance or, you know, whatever it might be. And so these, these factors, um, this will be kind of, a, um, again, a, a, an analogy or kind of an image that we'll reference in terms of budget conversations with the council uh, and the commission moving forward. How do we balance these three uh, aspects in accomplishing our mission? So uh, a couple of the, the uh, near-term asks for the council and the commission and, um, and then a little bit longer term. Lindsay touched on this a little bit already, so I'll just be really brief uh, and open it up to discussion and questions. But the, the purpose of today's meeting, and uh, really I just wanna say thanks to you all for, um, this is a long presentation, but just to appreciate your receptiveness. 
in hearing this. And this is, this is a, a big deal, I think, for us as staff to have this opportunity. And what we hope you take away is just a greater understanding of the challenges that we're facing and some of these comparisons with other agencies. Um, and some of the type of, of decisions that we'll need to consider in the coming uh, coming weeks and months here. So um, understanding the challenges, gaining a greater awareness on some of these priorities, we'll continue to talk about these. And in that context, one thing that we would ask for both the commission and the council is to really help us stay focused on our mission. Um, especially through the pandemic, there have been a lot of factors that have uh, pulled us away at times from our core mission. And so as we go through our budget, uh, really helping us stay honest with ourselves and, and in the spirit of serving the community, uh, staying focused on our mission. Uh, one thing that I know we're working on collectively is the, the camping ordinance or the outdoor living ordinance. This is a really critical one. And so just wanted to reiterate that point that Lindsay made earlier. Uh, that's really critical for Parks and Rec toward allowing us to um, work on our mission and rather than, you know, constant sort of reactive uh, uh, camp cleanups and, and so forth. Um, going down to some of the longer term needs and requests, Lindsay alluded to this already uh, in the fiscal sustainability planning, but the ballot measure or a ballot measure, uh, potential bond measure, um, also department optimization efforts, um, and what that means, again, is some of the stuff that Lindsay talked about in terms of partnership agreements, what do we subsidize, what do we not subsidize, where do we look to bring in uh, higher cost recovery, where do we, um, you know, where are we supportive of, of greater subsidy, for example. So I think really optimizing how we bring in revenues, where we bring in revenues, and then what we provide to the community at low to, to no cost, I think is a really important uh, piece to go through. And then this meeting itself, I think, is, a, is, um, is, again, great. I think it's a really great opportunity for us. And it's a little bit different than our annual report that we presented a few weeks ago. And it's a little bit different than the budget conversation we'll have in the coming weeks. But um, in, terms of, um, in terms of the Parks and Rec Department, um, there was a, a comment a few weeks ago during our annual report that the Parks and Rec Department is a quiet giant. And we do a lot and provide a lot of different services across the city. And so I think this meeting uh, would be something that perhaps we pair with our annual report that we do every year and have a, a, a joint study session much like this one to give a bit of a, a state of parks and recreation each year before we go into the budget conversation. So this is a much deeper dive than what we've done before, but I think with the scope of what we do in parks and recreation, uh, and the value that the community puts on its parks and recreation services. Uh, we see a lot of value in this and, and uh, would hope that we could do this uh, in the future, uh, again, for transparency and just collaboration and, uh, and prioritization uh, moving forward. So um, we, we hustled through that and we still took over an hour, but I appreciate your guys' time so much. And uh, I will send it back over to Mayor Myers uh, from here. Thank you, Tony, um, and thank you, Lindsay. Really, really, um, yeah, great presentation. Sobering, but um, really well developed and gives us um, a lot of information and I think really diagnostically what we're up against to really keep this treasure of our parks department running, you know, for future, really for future generations, I mean, you guys did a really good job of really diagnostic, diagnosing sort of where, why we are where we are and sort of some of the hard uh, decisions we'll have to make in the future. Um, and I think even though, you know, we think about other general funded um, departments like fire and police and others, um, and they all provide essential services. And I think what COVID has really showed us is that you are that kind of department as well. And, I think, Lindsay, you, you, you put it exactly right, which is that you provide an invisible, invisible social safety net for so many people in our community. And to me, that, that levels your, um, your, uh, your importance to our community in a huge way, because um, that is exactly what happened during COVID and will continue to, as we pull people out of, out of COVID and we provide the uh, the things that people need um, to put their lives back together. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and um, maybe start with questions. My understanding, Tony, is 
providing direction, um, I just wanna make sure I'm clear what you would want from council today in terms of exploring some of those goals maybe that you did put up and I don't know if there's sort of a motion that you have you might have in mind in terms of that direction but um, maybe we'll start with our guests the Parks Commission I know that they have been working really hard all year on this and I just want to recognize all of your work you guys are um, I think a really really effective Parks Commission and um, had the pleasure of serving with many of you and have known many of you for a long, long time. So I think we have a really great group of minds working on this and I wanna compliment your work. And I'll turn it over to questions maybe from commissioners first and then go into council members and then we'll try to get to some kind of direction as you need, Tony, from us in terms of I'm assuming kind of how you wanna approach budget, the budget um, discussion or budget direction from council on, on, the, parks, on the parks budget, okay. I see you naughty. Okay, I will um, look for any commissioners that would like to make comments now. And uh, if you could throw your hand up. I've got Jillian, go ahead, please. Thank you, ma'am. And is this uh, questions or comments or a bit of both? What would you prefer? Why don't we start with questions and then uh, we could get clarification on any of the slides or information pr presented and then um, I'll do the same with council and then we'll go back into comments and deliberation if that sounds thank, good. Thank you. I have some small questions um, um, and maybe Tony or Lindsay and thank you very much not only for the written materials but the presentation it was very clear, very helpful and maybe I'll just um, ask all the little questions all at once because uh, you know they're short answers I think and that may be more efficient if that's all right. I was um, curious under the pricing and revenue policy of creating revenue strategies number five um, to, the aim is to reduce the general fund subsidy for non-essential WEC programs and services. So I was curious if you could give an example of that. Um, and then uh, under the focus operations, under fiscal sustainability roadmap, um, what would be an example of regional efficiency opportunities? Um, a uh, third quick, quick question, hopefully quick question. Um, what does streamline the park portfolio mean? And um, two others. Uh, one is, sorry, I took so many notes. Um, one is the, uh, could you, could you, sh oh, you put forward um, 12 million in deferred maintenance, and but that really should be 100 million. I was wondering if you could sort of fill in the gap between those two. Mm -hmm. And uh, another one, I've noticed that the, the, the department is responsible for cleaning the police station, City Hall and Pacific Avenue. Wondered if you could share why and uh, I noticed no nothing on here about in your presentation about the range of program possibilities so I'd love to hear a bit more about where that might fit in to the whole thing and I think that might be all uh, yes I think I'll leave it at that for the moment thank you Thank you, Jillian. Tony, I'm a Tony, and um, I'm assuming you guys will want to run through these questions, you know, as people ask them, and then leave a little time for deliberation. Okay. Sounds good. And Lindsay, I think several of those questions were on the uh, fiscal sustainability roadmap, so I'll send it back yeah. to you. 
Yep. Um, so I believe the first question was on the revenue policy, and that was an example of a non-essential service. And so um, a non-essential service would not receive um, as much of a subsidy as an essential service. And what we define as non-essential services um, are things like uh, facility rentals, um, the permitted events that we do, um, specialty classes. It's where an individual is deriving, you know, private benefits um, to that. Things that have more of a cost share um, associated with them are some of our uh, youth programs um, where there is, you know, it's a specialty class, but maybe um, we want to subsidize to a certain degree, but maybe not fully. Um, and then some of our more heavily subsidized programs are things like um, our senior programming, um, uh, vulnerable youth programming, so team center programming, um, things of that nature. Um, so that was uh, some examples there. Um, you also asked about um, the, regula the agency regulatory efficiency. So that was in the um, uh, fiscal sustainability roadmap that was in your packet. And early on, we included that as a, as a draft. The one that I presented in the presentation, which we'll make sure you get a copy of, is slightly different. Um, early on, as we were putting that together, we were actually considering the possibility of, you know, could we merge services with other county parks agencies? And so those conversations, you know, were um, uh, uh, happening. Um, it's looking uh, right now um, that that might be more, more challenging um, for our city system um, itself, but uh, which is why it wasn't included in the version that I spoke to today, but um, it was at one point. Um, and then uh, the comment about, uh, as well, um, streamlining the park's portfolio, um, I think that speaks to, in some uh, respects, the fact that um, in order to um, operate, we did have to um, uh, close certain park um, uh, services. Um, given the staffing levels that we had. Um, there's also, like in those moments, you know, we, um, we are faced with decisions of either closure or is there an opportunity to um, maybe let go of a less utilized um, portion of the park system. Um, and so that was kind of the nature of that conversation. Um, I don't think that's a position any of us want to be in, um, but that's where we were earlier this year. Um, and as you know, we ended up um, making park closures. Um, I'll cover the difference in the $12 million unfunded and the $100 million, and I'll invite Tony to jump in if he has any additional uh, comments there. And then on the last question around um, maintenance of City Hall and downtown, I'll look to our Park Superintendent um, Travis Beck on that one. Um, but to the CIP um, unfunded um, uh, amount of $12 million that was included in the, in the slide, uh, that was part of last year's packet. Those are the projects where we have rough estimates of what the cost would be. However, there are parts of the system and there are facilities out there where we have outdated um, materials of what it would take to bring that facility back or we're in the process of getting more detailed information about um, what repairs would actually cost. And so kind of the 12 million is what is most immediately in our face. But when we look more expansively, we know that number is bigger, and we're estimating that that number is closer to 100 million. So you could give details on that at a later time. Well, actually, that's a, it's it's an effort that we uh, want to embark on as a department, which is to really flesh out uh, what that number actually is. So that you know we can stop talking in like big broad estimates and really provide a detailed look, but that will take you know concerted effort and probably you know enlisting a consultant to help us do that work. And good afternoon, um, Council and Commissioners. This is Travis Beck, Superintendent of Parks. Uh, Commissioner Greenset, you asked about some of the areas that aren't as obviously parks and the maintenance work that our staff do there, so I can just uh, provide a brief clarification on that. Until recently, it's true that we did maintain the landscape around the police department, 
and that was one of the operational efficiencies that we were able to achieve at the beginning of this fiscal year was the police department graciously uh, agreed to take on responsibility for that maintenance in their budget and contract that work out um, so we no longer do that work. At City Hall, uh, we share responsibility for maintenance of the campus with the Public Works Facilities team, uh, and our focus is on the, the plant and the horticultural elements primarily. And that is a, a subject that we have uh, considered and discussed internally is, uh, you know, City Hall is a, a, a key focus point for city staff and the public and part of the image of the city, um, but does not really provide recreational opportunities for the community. So um, is that the best place to devote our maintenance resources or should we uh, really pull off from that in order to take care of other areas? So that, that is an open question and we would value input on that. And in terms of uh, the Pacific Avenue and downtown areas, again, we share maintenance responsibility with um, the parking department, with uh, public works department, uh, sanitation for maintenance of the various features downtown. And the ones that parks is responsible for are the more park-like ones, benches, trees, planter, beds, et cetera. Um, and given the recent inclusion of uh, downtown and the interim recovery plan and the focus there, uh, we have considered that an important place to continue and even enhance our maintenance efforts, um, for example, with the recent uh, renovations that we've done at the town clock. That's good. And the ranges, I guess that was the last question. We'll put that in the... Um, We'll, we'll put that in the bucket, Tony. Does that sound right for direction later? Or Rangers, yep, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you, Jillian, and thank you, everyone. I'll move on to Holly, and then Jane, and then JM. And we are, uh, we're running a little bit late. We do have a, another meeting at four with uh, invited speakers, so um, we'll hopefully hit everything and have, have time for everybody to have a good deliberation. Uh, Holly, Jane, and Jam. Thank you for the presentation. I'll keep this brief in order to get everybody else's questions in too. Um, I'm just going to ask specifically um, about the golf course. And you said you thought we were in the black. So does that mean it was absolutely not subsidized at all by uh, the general fund? Is that what I'm hearing? And if we did that, let's do that maybe for a pool? I don't know. Yeah, Holly, just really quickly, as of the end of quarter three, uh, this fiscal year, we are in the black by approximately $130,000. So that means a um, uh, uh, net, um, how am I trying to say this, a net uh, positive revenue for the general fund. That is awesome. Let's do it for the pool, too. Get back, please. <laughs> okay, next is Jane Neal, please. Hi, Jane. Hi, Don. Uh, I just have a question real quick. Has there ever been a breakdown in how much um, time and money the Ranger program actually saves in regard to the maintenance crew being able to do their work? Not to my knowledge. No. That's a Thank good you. question. Thank you. And JM. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just two questions. Um, the first is uh, um, that the city receives. Um, Cam, you have a bad connection. Uh, I'll, I'll take my camera off. Sorry, is that better? That's better, yeah. Okay, sorry about that. So my question was about the Measure H funding that the city receives, and I was just curious about what percentage of that comes into the Parks and Recreation budget as parks improvements were a key component of the uh, quest of public to pass this measure. Yeah, Lindsay may have the best detail on that. And for the, for the sake of the full commission and council in the interest of time, we could uh, put together a full report on that as well. I think measure, um, measure E and Measure H, we've done some analysis on that recently and could share that as a follow-up. 
Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think that's relative to the discussion about a future ballot measure. Um, then the second question is whether um, the city or the department specifically has applied for any hazard mitigation grants with the California Department of um, Emergency Services, which has just put out a whole new line of funding to do fire prevention work, et cetera. I can speak to that briefly. To my knowledge, uh, our department has not applied for those grants in particular. However, we have collaborated quite closely with the fire department who sees grant funding from a number of sources. Uh, in order to do um, vegetation management and uh, wildfire risk mitigation work in our wildland urban interface. Okay, great. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. I'll now uh, look to see if there are any questions from council at this point. Uh, council Member Golder, Council Member, oh, sorry, Johnson, Council Member Brown, and then Council Member Watkins, please. I also just wanted to thank um, the whole commission. Thank you guys for volunteering so much time to, um, to serve the community in this capacity. It's such an important role, and I thank the uh, Parks Department for all your work bringing this forward. And I have one question regarding some of the cleanups that happened this year. I know there was, or I guess it might have been last year at this point, but um, the, like Sycamore Grove and those sorts of things, were those some of the areas that would have been gray? And if so, like, can you give us an approximation of what those co costs were? Uh, Travis, are you still there? Would you um, yeah. give those numbers offhand? Yeah, you're asking about the costs for areas such as the cleanup that was done in Lower Pelganip of Highway 9 and the Sycamore Grove area. Yeah, so just basically cleaning up after large encampments was kind of. Yeah, I have um, some figures here for our, our totals um, so far for this fiscal year, which would include those cleanups as well as some smaller ones. And uh, they are including a dumpster fees um, around $200,000 for uh, sort of cleanup and disposal of debris, as well as a small amount of restoration that we did afterwards. And that does not include uh, any staff time and the associated costs there. So it is a, a very considerable uh, expense for our department and the city. Okay, thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Great, thank you so much for the presentation and the materials, um, really thorough and easy to follow and understand. I have a, a few questions. Uh, one is around the fiscal sustainability roadmap. Um, this was in the packet, but I didn't see it on the slide. In the interim, the midterm um, goals, it said reaching regional efficiency opportunities across agencies. So I just wanted a little clarification on what that looked like, what does regional efficiency opportunities mean? Um, and then in, um, I believe the long-term goal um, reaching, or I think it was interim, midterm, um, reaching our current cost recovery target. And I'm sorry if I missed this, but what, what is our current cost recovery target? So those are two questions I had under fiscal sustainability. And then um, I have questions around the golf course. That certainly stood out to me as, a, a lot of expenditure and, and not recovering our costs. I'm glad to hear we were in the black today. Uh, I guess how did we how did that happen? What made it so that we were in the black not today this year? Um, and just have we have we looked at I guess benefits and and uh, challenges? You know what percentage of our population uses these resources? compared to the cost, compared to the recovery? And that might be a, a bigger question and, and not appropriate for right now, but those were the questions that I had. Thank you. Sure, yeah, just to respond to those. Um, on the golf course, uh, I'd be happy to share our operations plan and it gets into all those details in terms of uh, the strategy and costs and fee increases and so forth. Uh, so we can share that with the commission and council um, and in the context of uh, we rolled that out about a year ago, about a year and a half ago, probably. Um, we had a grand jury inquiry as well. And so we had a number of um, 
commitments in that context as well that we've really achieved at this point, but we'll, we can submit a report uh, on those details. Uh, in terms of cost recovery, we don't have a specific cost recovery target. Um, over the past uh, 10 year, 10 to 12 years, our cost recovery uh, has varied anywhere between about 40% or you know, 30, 38 to 40% uh, to a low of probably around 23%. So that was on that uh, bar graph that we looked at um, uh, earlier on. But we don't have a specific target. So we don't say our target is 60% or 50% cost recovery um, on an annual basis. Um, and your first question. Can I step in on the cost recovery question too? Um, th that's absolutely correct from a department standpoint. Um, and I think that would be a great area of conversation between council, um, city manager's office, finance, and ourselves in terms of what is that sweet spot. However, the work that we did through the recreation and leisure study did give us more insight into what that cost recovery looks like for priority program areas. And so we're working internally to understand through this business planning effort, what would a better or feasible cost recovery target be for FY22 and begin to work towards that next year and then really begin to dial things in for fiscal year 23. Yeah, thanks, Lindsay. Um, and then I think this is a question that Commissioner Greenside asked as well, um, but related to regional opportunities. And so this is geared toward, it could be, um, administrative functions or recreation or parks, really any aspect, but um, especially through the pandemic, what we've seen, for example, Scotts Valley uh, basically uh, laid off more or less their entire uh, recreation department within the city. And so there could be regional opportunities whereby um, uh, our department, you know, works with Scotts Valley uh, in some way to provide recreation services in Scotts Valley um, uh, you know, in, in place of the, the services that they've had to cut. Um, to be candid, we have not found those opportunities yet uh, that make a lot of sense because we've been impacted by the pandemic and it would be a stretch for us to expand our services outside of the city. But there are those constant conversations about are there efficiencies to be had by working together across agencies, whether it's county parks, uh, Capitola, Watsonville, Scotts Valley, and so forth. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Council Member Brown. I'll add my uh, my thank yous to the Parks and Rec Commissioners. Uh, I, I just think that the way you work together and uh, tackle the big issues and provide good advice to us um, is, is just really incredible and I thank you for all of the work you do. Um, and to our staff for uh, doing so much with so little and be, remaining cheerful about it the, the whole way. I really appreciate you know everything you all do. Um, I and so um, Councilmember Carlin Terry Johnson asked my question I, or most of the question around cost recovery, um, but I did want to ask a follow up related to that around your thinking uh, about cost recovery among different kind of buckets of programming, right? So we we um, we know that there are some programs that are highly subsidized, but really, really important to our community um, and um, probably utilized by, um, you know, people with less ability to pay. Um, so one kind of within the cost recovery thinking, if you have, um, you know, if you're differentiating at all um, and what that might mean for how we move forward. And then, um, you know, an issue that is just always a concern to me uh, is the, as we talk about cost recovery, uh, that there are, you know, some with a much greater ability to pay than others. And because we have, legal constraints on how we address that, um, you know, I just am, am, am wanting to think about that and, and see how, you know, whatever help we can provide or I, you know, if I can um, be involved in fundraising or any, you know, ways to kind of just be able to um, mitigate the increased cost for, um, for people who need um, additional assistance. And I know FOPAR has done a great job. I'm excited that we've been able to use some of the children's fund, um, but other ways of, you know, maybe um, encouraging those who utilize our programs who have more of an ability to pay to help support um, others. So 
Uh, I see, and I had another question, um, but I think I'll leave it there for now in the interest of time. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Watkins, and then Commission Member um, Scott Norris. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, and just are you know similar to my colleagues. I want to express my sincere appreciation and gratitude to the entire commission for your time and volunteer and service to our, our city in this really meaningful way, and of course to our entire city um, parks and rec department. That's just awesome. I you know I I will keep my question short in the in the interest of time. I um, I guess I have one question, one comment. So the first question is in terms of what was brought up around a revenue measure. Um, you know, what, where is the thought with that? And maybe that's part of the potential uh, action we would have or discussion we'd have for further action at a future time. But I'd love to learn more about if, you know, there's a context in terms of history, but also potential for direction um, for the revenue potential for revenue measure or bond measure. And then just really want to echo the equity comments made by my colleague, Councilor Brown, in regards to just how are we thinking about that in this failing for access? Um, and then lastly, and maybe this is what will go into the next study session, but how are we thinking about um, synergy between and our needs for capital questions and, uh, oh, did you lose me? We lost you a little bit there, Martin, yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I think my last my last really question or comment was one around the equity. I don't know if I, I don't know where you guys lost me, but the equity piece just yes, definitely. And around the green economy and how are we going to you know bridge the infrastructure improvements and capital improvements with what's happening at the federal level to um, our needs for capital improvements at the Parks and Rec Department. Sorry about that. Thank you. And Dawn, go ahead, please. Um, I wanted, first of all, thank Tony, Lindsay, and Travis. Thank you so much. Uh, outstanding presentation, and I really, really got a great deal out of it. Um, I'm going to echo about the Rangers. Uh, where would, um, if we were able to, and we did discuss this at a commission meeting somehow, consider uh, in the future uh, adding the rangers back because um, we've had, we've lost our enforcement arm. And uh, where would that be seen in the budget? Should we be able to do that in the future? And also if, if you have any current um, information about the stimulus that is coming to the city, you're probably waiting, but if you have any uh, information about that um, that's current, I'd like to know about that. Thank you very much. Great. So we'll follow up on those questions. And then um, Lindsay and Tony, I, I kind of went back through my your staff report and I'm, and I'm thinking maybe the fiscal sustainability roadmap slide might be helpful for us to kind of pull up and sort of gear, kind of look at that as a place to give you some further direction and kind of scope out um, and I maybe I'll ask Martine Bernal to discuss the revenue measure and where that is right now or if there will be one and then Tony as you see fit for those other questions that came up and then I see um, Jillian and JM have additional questions or comments and I think we'll just sort of move into comments and deliberation now and try to you know narrow to some specific my understanding um, at least from the presentation, is that this whole idea of really understanding cost recovery in a more meaningful way for the department seems to be a really critical path uh, thing for us to say, yes, keep doing that, keep doing that work for us um, and bring back those policies as needed. Um, the other is um, really around um, the this, this basically really understanding the impacts uh, over the time uh, to never really getting back to those staffing models that were working back in the day, um, which of course has ramifications on the sort of the deficit, you know, the, the increasing costs, but the fact that the department
department is really just at, it's operating at a deficit with regards to the true need of what's happening. Um, so maybe really understanding a, a timeline or a mechanism to to bring staffing levels up to a place where um, the department feels that that is need that that is needed. Um, there was a, a lot about making sure we have a more direct statement of need for the CIP and then evaluating all services and possible investigating new service models. I think some of that as well. So maybe we'll pull that slide up and I'll go back to um, discussions now. And uh, let's see, Jillian, you're next and then JM and then Jane. Thank you, ma'am. Um, so this is now comments and I'm building on what um, uh, Tony started with about what distinguishes us, not only for having a stellar department and a jewel in our park system, but that we are a tourist town, which he compared us to Santa Barbara, which has a bigger cost recovery. Otherwise, we're pretty much in the ballpark with our cost recovery. I therefore think, having observed the parks department being cut, every time there's a budget crisis over the past 20 years. If it were me, I would not be sweating at a, for a greater cost recovery. I would be asking for a fair share from the general fund. The general fund is infused by a lot of funds that come from tourists using our town. And so I think it would be a mistake to um, go too far in that direction of trying to get our cost recovery up by charging, especially charging more for locals. If there's a way to have the big events pay more, terrific. But in general, I think something like a parks department needs to draw on the general fund. So I think I've made that point. I won't repeat myself. The next bit, and this is the last bit I'll share as an opinion or a comment, is, and it's in line with the first comment of us being a heavily tourist town and people using our facilities, and we just cannot, as a small 65,000 community, person community, pay for all of that. I think that the wharf should get all of the funding, I've said this for many years, so it's no surprise to Tony, I think all of the revenue from parking on the wall should go to the Parks and Recreation Department, that it should not be split or, and part of it go to the general fund. The maintenance associated with cars using the wharf um, and everything that's associated with it, if that revenue went to the Parks Department, and was earmarked for wharf capital improvement, I think we'd see a much healthier balance with the wharf. Uh, so I'm a bit of a broken record on that, but I feel quite strongly that that is needed. So I'll leave it there in the interest of time. Thank you. Thank you, Jillian. Next up is JM. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, I just wanted to um, uh, underline a couple of things that have already been mentioned. One, I think the, the pandemic has taught us, if nothing else, um, how critical it is to have healthy parks and open spaces for people to enjoy and recreate, get out of their homes. Um, and so I think it's, I'm gonna stress the importance to our council members of, of giving our department through the budget processes the resources they need uh, specifically uh, to, to maintain our parks and uh, to keep them safe. And on that note, I, I wanna echo um, some other comments from commissioners about um, consideration of returning the parks ranger program to the department. I'd like to see a, a cost analysis of that at some future point um, to determine if there would be um, if there would be benefit to the department in reducing uh, the costs that are currently related to safety but for which we don't really have an appropriate program to deal with it um, I think that the cost argument was one made to council and commission a couple of years ago in terms of why we should move the 
ranger program over to the police department, but I think we've ended up paying for it in other ways, in, in a lack of um, direct service to our community through a, a parks ranger program that's based in the parks department. Um, and then just lastly on the ballot measure issue, which I know we're gonna get more of an update on from the city manager, um, I, you know, if, if there is one coming forward um, that could benefit the parks department, I would recommend that we have a discussion about restricting that ask of the public to our parks program. I think the last time, uh, if memory serves, when we asked the public to support our parks programs, we added a lot of other very valuable um, items to the list, but I'm not sure um, that the public really understands how much of that went back into the park system uh, relative to my question earlier about Measure H. And so I think the public will get behind a measure that will be explicitly for the park system, even if it might uh, require a larger threshold from the voters to um, pass it. Um, and with that, I'll just um, close by thanking once again the, um, the staff for their great presentation and my fellow commissioners, and I want to thank the council for giving us this valuable time with you to um, consider these important critical issues for our department. Thank you, J.M. Next up is Jane. Yes, yeah, thank you uh, for everybody's work on my beloved park and rec department. <laughs> One of the things that I think we saw very clearly, as JM already said, is how important the park, uh, parks and open space were to the community. If we hadn't had that much space, I think many of us would have gone more loony than necessary. Uh, the, the parks and open spaces have a really um, unique situation because it addresses community priorities and also it fits in with the health and all policies. And just for that, that it is uh, you know, physical and mental health savior, it should get special consideration within the budget because those kind of things don't really have a name or a specific category, and yet they're vital in the prior priorities of how a community treats its community. So uh, the park rangers are really necessary to come back because I can tell you from experience, boots on the ground, on the levee, the situation wouldn't have gotten that terrible if we had had the park rangers there. And that expense is really, really high. And I, that I end, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Uh, Martine is next. Martine Bernal. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to just uh, answer some of the questions and then just provide a, a, bit, a really brief overview of the overall budget picture and how it relates to parks and recreation. Because uh, I think it clarifies some of these uh, questions that have been asked. So, you know, essentially with the city looking at a structural budget deficit, uh, and when you look at the general fund, the general fund largely supports parks and recreation, police and fire. That's really essentially the bulk of what the general fund supports. So anytime you look at a deficit in the general fund, you're really looking at impacting those three departments. Uh, so uh, because those are the departments largely supported by, by that fund. Uh, the, so when we look into the future, what it means is that without, essentially without an additional revenue source, we don't have the option to enhance, improve, or sustain what we have. That is really what we're facing and what's before us. Um, there are things we can do as outlined by the staff here in terms of cost recovery and other, other things that we can be do, that can be done to kind of support, but essentially in the end, uh, a new revenue source is really needed in order to do what I think what people want, what people's aspirations are. Um, and uh, Measure H, uh, to answer um, that question, you know, provided some level of funding. It was about a, a third of that additional 
uh, increase in tax that was approved uh, back in, I think it was 2005, uh, which is around, uh, I guess it's now more like close to a million dollars worth of funding. That continues to be dedicated to the Parks Department, and it was for park safety measures primarily uh, at the time. Uh, but, uh, but again, it's not really sufficient to be able to keep up with the rising costs as well as the, uh, as you saw, the level of investments that are really needed for capital and for staffing to maintain even our existing facilities. And also to bring back what people want, like the pool, uh, and to enhance uh, some other programs and services. So again, it really is come down to trying to identify a, a new revenue source to be able to, to do that. Um, so with respect to that, the council did uh, create a, uh, a but, uh, I'm sorry, revenue committee that's looking at the potential to bring forward a ballot measure. Uh, they are have been looking at uh, the potential uh, taxes that could, could be uh, uh, increased uh, that might be supported by the general public. Uh, there is a stage where a survey, a public opinion survey is being uh, drafted as we speak uh, with the hope of that going out in the next few weeks. Uh, so that will give the, us the first piece of data to see what kind of support there is in the community around such a ballot measure, with the idea being that the, the earliest possible opportunity to place a measure on the ballot would be November uh, of this year. Uh, and if that is uh, to be uh, uh, done, the council would have to make a decision uh, by the end of June. Uh, they, they actually have until July, but they're, they don't meet in, in, in July. So June is the goal to uh, have the council ultimately make a decision as to whether to move forward with a ballot measure in, in November or not. And we'll be doing that polling uh, pretty soon, just again, to get that first set of data to see if there's that the level of public support to, to move forward with that. Uh, if so, uh, the council will bring that forward to the, the, I'm sorry, the subcommittee will bring that forward to the full council. Uh, and if not, they'll, they'll do a presentation one way or the other, and then potentially, if there's not support for November, then look towards a, a future date if that's possible. Uh, the other quick thing with respect to the stimulus funding, because I think uh, the way the stimulus funding has, has impacted communities across the state really varies considerably. Santa Cruz is was particularly hard hit hard by the pandemic. And there's a couple of factors that makes it so that for us, the, the stimulus funding really isn't uh, what uh, the kind of it hasn't had the kind of impact that uh, maybe other communities have has had. One of those is that um, being a tourism-based community, our revenue losses are pretty significant and pretty deep, and so the level of, of uh, impact for us was pretty great. So uh, we're getting about approximately 14, 15 million dollars in uh, stimulus funding, but we lost over 20 million dollars in revenue. So what we're getting doesn't even cover our revenue losses. Uh, in addition, because we're considered generally a you know, relatively affluent community as compared to other communities, the level of funding that we received as compared to other communities where they have uh, maybe uh, a higher degree of, of poverty, but they didn't suffer the same amount of loss because they, were, they didn't have tourism-based economy. So for some, it, you know, they were able to get additional revenue or revenue that made up for their revenue losses, plus they're able to implement additional measures and investments and other things. So you're, you're seeing some communities investing in things, doing extra things, but that's because of the, the way the, the formula worked in their particular circumstances. So for us, unfortunately, uh, the revenue buys us time in order to be able to address our structural problem and to plan um, and to avert you know, major uh, reductions in the short term, but we do still have to look at the, uh, making reductions if we don't, if we're not able to identify a, a revenue measure moving forward. So that is our challenge to find fiscal sustainability by either uh, making reductions in, in new revenues uh, or, or both is really what we'll have to look at. That's, that's our reality moving forward. Okay. I have uh, Council Member Golder, and then I might see if we can wrap up so we have our four o'clock start time. Um, and I think I've got direction kind of notes for you guys, Tony. Council Member Golder. So I just have one follow-up question. It was, you know, I, Jane actually made me remember, but I remember in an earlier presentation there was, uh, I think Tony, you mentioned that there was several um, parks department staff that were assaulted during their regular duties, and I was just wondering if there was any cost associated with that, like um, um, in terms of injury or absence from work or that sort of thing. 
Yeah, uh, good question. I know that there is cost to that. I don't know what that is offhand, but we can um, we can put that together. All right. Thank you. So I believe Tony, and please chime in here as we sort of bring this over the finish line. Um, I heard several, both council members and commissioners, um, really re want to revisit the the move of the rangers out of parks and over to police and. It looks, sounds like that is one thing maybe to explore. Um, and I don't know if that's coming back with a proposal during budget period or sort of the, the basically what I heard was that, you know, the, the belief that if we did have our rangers in our parks, we might not be experiencing quite as much of the degree of cost that, um, that Mr. Beck um, outlined. And so I think that was one thing. I think um, the other is, you know, based on sort of your, your the roadmap here is um, agreement, at least to some extent, on uh, understanding what we need, would need to do uh, from a ballot measure perspective to really support our parks and be um, it sounds like very proactive as standing up parks as one of the big pillars in any kind of revenue measure effort in terms of the benefits that are realized by our community and the commitment to try to keep service provision at a reasonable level for folks across the spectrum in terms of that equity need across our whole population. Um, also, um, Councilmember Brown brought up, you know, uh, increasing sort of outside and partnership efforts on fundraising and other things so that we have a robust um, sort of nonprofit arm to, to our efforts where we can, we can potentially help addish, with additional needs, uh, whether that's for scholarships or other costs, um, you know, costs that could potentially be fundraised towards. Um, I also heard uh, support, I believe, for really looking at your performance metrics um, and that, you know, again, the cost recovery ideas. Um, obviously, you built a business plan for the golf course that seems to be working. So this idea of business plans also seem to be supportive. So it seems like you guys are very much in line with all the comments you're hearing. I'm seeing Vice Mayor Bruner's hand up, and I know we haven't heard from her yet, so I wanna make sure I catch her comments. Um, as we sort of finish up. Uh, but I think um, overall, I'm hearing a lot of consensus around what you've built here with some specifics around Rangers and some other call outs that I think would, would be helpful to have um, come back to the, to the council. And Vice Mayor Bruner, I'd love to have you chip in, chime in here as well as Mr. Brown. Thank you. I just quickly, um, you actually just summarized what I was going to say, Mayor Myers, and um, I think from all the comments, we're in agreement that Parks and Rec is essential to our, not only to our individual well-being, but our collective well-being of our community and vital in prioritizing and investing in in Parks and Rec department and staffing. Um, having boots on the ground, uh, having those eight frozen positions staffed, having the support needed is the direction that um, we can all agree we need to work towards moving forward in terms of supporting these programs and um, the department as a whole. Great, thank you, Vice Mayor. And uh, Council, uh, Commissioner Brown. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Just one other thought um, as you were reading that list of, of items uh, for consideration. The eight unfunded FTEs in park maintenance. Um, I wonder if there's benefit to the council and the commission having a discussion about how to fund um, those positions potentially with existing resources uh, and not just leave that particular very urgent question um, to be related to the uh, potential ballot measure. Great, thank you for catching that. Thank you. Director Elliott, do you have a, 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 a sufficient uh, to-do list to do for starting <laughs> your course through the end of the budget hearings this year? Uh, I think so, I think this is really good feedback and this is exactly what we were looking for. We really just wanted to understand from the commission and the council 
what is it that you need to help make these policy decisions um, and, and prioritize into the future. So this is really helpful. Um, we, yeah, we've got a lot of homework here. On the Ranger discussion, um, uh, just to be honest, that's probably not something that we can pull together for the budget conversations. What I wanna be sure to do um, is collaborate very closely with the police department in terms of um, you know, with the shift that we've had from Parks and Rec over to the police department, what does this need to look like? What are the what are the costs? What is the best format for this? So I think there's a fair amount of analysis that we need to do on that, and I think it would be a little bit haphazard if we tried to get that ready, uh, you know, for uh, the next couple of weeks here for the budget process. But that's something that we can put some um, some time and effort into, uh, definitely for um, you know for policy discussion down the road. But no, again, I just wanted to thank the commission uh, and thank the council so much for this opportunity. And um, yeah, this feels like a very unique opportunity. So just appreciate it. Um, and Mayor Myers, I think as you outlined the different, uh, these different items, I think that's um, that's perfectly outlined. So we'll, uh, we've got our notes, we'll follow up, um, especially on some of the questions. And I think we're in, in good shape from here. So thank you guys for your time today. Thank you very much, and thanks to the staff. Great job, really helpful um, presentation. Mm -hmm. So thanks so much. Mayor Myers? Yes. Mayor, I, you didn't open it for public comment. Oh, shoot. Okay. <laughs> You're right. Okay. I will now open this item up for public comment. If you are interested in commenting on the report on Parks and Recreation Department budget and financial outlook, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak to this item on our, on our agenda today? Please raise your hand by pressing star nine now. I am not seeing any hands coming up. So again, I want to thank our staff and uh, all the commissioners. Thank you so much for joining us today. And um, everybody have a great rest of the afternoon. And we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Lindsay. Thank you, Tony. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Go right into the next Zoom. So you'll go to your next link that you got. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.